All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session. Uh, uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. We start with the teaching. Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful time of God you've given us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, ministering to us, Lord, and we pray Lord, that you will continue to speak to us and uh, and Lord, may your Holy Spirit lead and guide us, oh God. We thank you for this entire course and all that we've been learning in this course, oh God. I pray that we will apply and use it in our lives, oh God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, I hope my audio is all right. Uh, maybe a little bit echoey. But it's all right. Okay. All right, so uh, today we will come to a close on this entire course. But what I wanted to do is I just wanted to wrap up with a few thoughts that I'd like to just uh, everything that we've talked about, uh, but just a few additional thoughts. I just thought I would share this. Then if we have any questions, we can ask those questions uh, and then we can close uh, for this semester. All right, so uh, I just want to talk about uh, you know, uh, lessons on discipleship. Um, and there are about 10 lessons that we can, uh, you know, just pick up from discipleship. I just thought I'd briefly share them and uh, three demands when it comes to discipleship. And uh, uh, this is just for us to, you know, uh, learn more, to understand more. Okay. Uh, so just 10 very important lessons uh, i'm sure you know if you read through the scriptures we have uh, a lot of lessons that we can learn right a lot of lessons when it comes to discipleship so these are just 10 that uh, that we just put down uh, and we just want to look at these 10 and then of course there's many more that we can learn so i i just paste it here on the chat right first one is prayer Right. So when it comes to discipleship, it is always important uh, to, you know, we talked about all these points, right? All 10 of them uh, we have talked about. Uh, but I just want to bring this course to a close, just making sure that you know, we understand the whole aspect of discipleship. Okay. Number one is prayer. When we talk about prayer, right? Uh, we talked about how everything that we do in ministry must be undergirded in prayer. The Lord Jesus, he had his times of prayer. He went alone to be with himself in the mountains, to be with the Lord, and he spent time in prayer, right? Now, when it comes to discipleship, prayer is of the essence. We have to learn to develop our prayer life. We must never come to a place where you say, okay, I pray this much, so then this is... I pray this much, okay, my ministry will be this good. It's, it's not about that. Prayer is, prayer is a relationship that we build with God, and God ministers to us. And that same thing that we receive from God, we release it, bringing in discipleship. Right. So as disciples, never come to a place where you say, okay, I... I will stick to what I'm doing, maybe one hour or two hours. Always look to develop in your, your prayer life. It's never too, it's never too less, or it's never more, too much. You can never say, okay, five hours of prayer is enough. You can never say that. That's the most beautiful part, right? Uh, especially when we are fellowshipping with God, it, it can just go on for uh, and on and on and on. Right? Uh, Number two is love. Paul writes to the Corinthians, uh, we've talked about this again. Uh, you know, if you have all kinds of gifts and skills and you have all kinds of prophecies and word of knowledge and all of these things, but if you do not have love, it's of no use. So as we pray, we receive the love of God and then we begin to walk in love. So when I look at a person and I feel that God is calling me to be a mentor, to this person, it's not a task, right? It's not another tick in our, uh, you know, in our resume, so to speak. It is an aspect of learning to love that person. They say, God, just as how you love him, help me to love this person. 
I may not agree with everything that he's saying, everything that he's doing, but help me to walk in love. Remember that verse, I love that verse, love covers a multitude of sins. So the person who's coming to you to be discipled or in your cell group or maybe even one-on-one, -on -one, learn to love them. It's not easy. It's not something that can come naturally at times. Uh, but we put in that effort of loving them. Right? Again, number three, this building relationships. We talked about this, right? As a leader, we must be people oriented. We must learn how to build relationships. And when we when it comes to discipleship, when it comes to mentoring either one on one or many people, learn to build relationships and these relationships can vary from being formal to very informal right look at the lord jesus i'm sure he had very informal relationships with his disciples right um, and when we build relationships we are able to speak into their lives we talked about this right even uh, the mentee or the person who's being mentored uh, will be able to, you know, s openly share their thoughts and their feelings and what they are going through. Right? Um, so building relationships is the key. The Lord Jesus set the example for us. He built relationships and then he spoke into their lives and they were able to do what God told, what the Lord Jesus told them to do. Right? He never had to force them. Nowhere in the scripture Nowhere in Jesus' earthly ministry did he force his disciples to do something. Right? He never forced them. Remember when uh, you know, uh, Jesus was uh, talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and this, when he said, you know, uh, I am the bread of life. You eat my body and drink my blood. Many of them were so offended, they walked away. Now, Jesus did not say, no, no, please come back. I have, I'll tell you better things. He didn't. What did he do? He looked to his disciples and he said, if you want to leave also, the door is open, you can leave. But they didn't. They said, the disciples said, where can we go? You have the words of life with you. So when you build relationships, you don't have to, uh, you know, at one point, you know that as a leader, you're able to speak into their life and they are able to, uh, you know, you're able to lead them to, towards the things of God. Right? Number four is to lead by example. Remember we talked about this? People will remember, may not remember all the sermons and all the teachings that I've made, but they will remember your life. The example that you live. And so lead by example. You see, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of this saying, right? Uh, preach it. I mean, sorry, do it, then preach it. Don't just be just hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. If I, as a leader, want to see people grow in the things of God, and I say, hey, everyone, you know, or if I'm ministering or mentoring somebody and say, hey, read the word, pray. And I'm, I'm saying this, and if I myself don't do it, what's happening? I'm not leading by example. If I tell people, hey, walk in humility, walk in love, but, uh, but I myself am not walking in humility and love, I'm not leading by example. Now, this is not just a, you know, a, a pretense leading by example. Oh, just because people are watching me. Uh, I will walk in this kind of way. But when nobody is watching, this is what I will do, just being the opposite. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus calls that hypocrisy. He says to the Pharisees, what does he say? He says, don't be like them because they stand in the street corners and pray so that people can see them and you know praise them for they are pretending to be holy. Now, when we lead by example, we don't put on a pretense. But we lead in a way that, you know, our character is seen. And our character is when nobody is watching us. 
what do we do? Right? To lead by an example. I love the Apostle Paul. He says, follow me, just as I follow Christ. And again, every I think many, many preachers and pastors around the world, there are maybe millions of them around the world. Nobody can say it yet. The Apostle Paul could say, follow me as I follow the example of Jesus. So very important as leaders when it comes to discipleship is to lead by example. Right, so let's go to the fifth point, right? Fifth point, being spirit-led and spirit-empowered when it comes to discipleship. One of the verses that always comes to my mind when we talk about spirit-led and spirit-empowered is Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. Can one of us please read that? Zechariah 4, 6, and I'll give you the context for what's happening here. Zechariah, is in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. Let's go ahead. Anyone can please read. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Yes. Even in the book of Galatians, it says, you know, Those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Right? So in Zechariah 4 6, it's a very powerful story. If you read that portion and how God with his mighty hands was able to use King Zerubbabel to build a temple in a time where there was constant, constant uh, attacks from the enemies from every side. And Zerubbabel was a good king. He honored the Lord. But he was in a place where he says, okay, what's the point of building this temple? Well, we build it, the enemy is going to come. Babylonians on one side, you got the Assyrians on another side, you got enemies all across, and they're going to come and destroy this temple. Even before we can probably put up the pillars, they're going to come and destroy it. There's no point of building this. And so Zerubbabel never took it seriously. He said, okay, I'm not going to even think about building this temple. But God speaks through the prophet Zechariah and says, Zerubbabel, it is not by might, it is not by your power, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord. By the Spirit of the Lord, by the anointing power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, Right? I will build this temple. All you need to do, Zerubbabel, is follow the instructions that Zechariah, my prophet, is going to give you. And sure enough, he was able to build the temple. Right? Uh, it was a time of unrest in Jerusalem. It was a time of complete unrest, chaos all over the place. But when we are led by the Spirit of God, God does the impossible through us. When it comes to discipleship, number one, you know, you know, we talk about these two these two aspects. Be spirit led. And right now, on, uh, our Sunday sermons, we're talking about being led by the Spirit. And so, there are many ways that we can pray and ask the Holy Spirit to lead us. He can give us a picture. He can give us a. a, a, a a, a word he can give us he can stir our spirit of knowing within a foreknowledge within a, 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 you know he can press into our spirit certain things to minister to the person let me tell you this one thing right it's, it's very important that we must remember this when it comes to discipleship we can speak a hundred words and it can touch the person but remember just one word of the scriptures of the word of god led by the holy spirit 
can really penetrate into a person's heart and change their lives for that. That is the difference of being spirit led. Now, I'm not saying that we don't use our mental abilities, right? Our natural abilities, like think and to minister and to uh, help a person. But it's also very important to be spirit led. How can I apply it? Spend time in here and say, God, Holy Spirit, I'm going to start cell group today, the evening, or I'm going to minister to this person. Maybe a person who's lost a loved one in their family. What do I say to them? Or maybe a person who is going through suicidal tendencies. Maybe somebody who's going through extreme financial difficulties, right? And it's been going on for many years. And years, you know, we can come up with a hundred solutions. But remember, we are not the people who are making the solution. God is the one who does the solutions. He has the answers to everything. And so when we are spirit-led, we are able to minister into the person's life. Right? Just one verse can touch them. Or one picture or an image that you see can touch that person's life. Why? Because you, that is not from your own, but it's by the Spirit. So heavily depend on the Holy Spirit when it comes to discipleship. No matter how uh, how many years you you and I have been ministering, no matter how many uh, how much of you know uh, capabilities or skills we have in that area, heavily depend on the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, I can't do this on my own, but you speak to me. I remember this one time I was I was speaking to a young man many years ago, and he was going through one of the most painful seasons of his life. And and as I was talking to him, he was just sharing it, but you know, he was sharing all the troubles and difficulties he was going through, but he had a smile on his face. And I kept thinking of this verse, you know. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise a standard against it. As he was talking to me, I just kept thinking of that verse. And I said, Holy Spirit, if this is from you, I'm going to share it with him. But let it be so meaningful to him. Let it touch his life. Let it minister to him powerfully that this pain that he's going through will be wiped away. You will give him the strength. You know, he lost his mother, he lost his uh, job. He was just going through this, everything at the same time. It was a terrible, terrible, painful time. But I remember just, I just put my hand on him many years ago. And I said, you know, there's this portion in the Bible. I didn't say, thus says the Lord, Isaiah 55 and all of that. I just said, you know, there's this portion of scripture in the Bible. It says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise a standard against him. And I just began to briefly, very briefly explain. See, what the spirit of the Lord does is sometimes floods come in. Uh, you know, when you look at a sea, the floods just can come in at any time. The storms of life, uh, it can just rise up at any time. But the spirit of the Lord raises a standard. And the, and the Hebrew, uh, when you talk about standard, is, is to raise up a, like a solid wall in front of you. Right? And, and so I just explained that to him. I said, the Spirit of the Lord can, will raise up a, a wall, but the enemy cannot penetrate that wall. Right? And, and I remember you know, it, just, it just brought so much of relief to that person. Now, it was, I could have told him, hey, meet me next week, meet me tomorrow after two days, and I'll talk to you, I'll counsel you, and all of that. Oh, that is good. Maybe he needs it. But at that moment, being spirit led, being spirit empowered, speak into that person's life. And so, as, as leaders, as disciples that God is calling us, remember to be spirit led. How can I be spirit led at all times? We've got the scriptures, we've got the Bible, we've got, we can always go back to God and pray and ask the Holy Spirit. And as, as from our side, we can also learn to step out into the, by using the gifts of the Holy Spirit, step out. And, uh, don't just 
you know, say, okay, this is how I'm going to do it. Don't just depend on your, your, our natural abilities, but depend on the Holy Spirit as well. All right. Okay. We are at the sixth point. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, sixth point. Equipping others to equip ourselves. Now, this is something that uh, at APC that we always want to do. We want to equip people. Many of you are from different parts of India, different parts of the nation. And all that you've been learning in these three years at Bible College uh, is an equipping. Maybe you already knew most of it. Maybe you have learned a lot of new things. You've learned to spend time in God's word. You've learned, you've grown. Right? If you look back from the first year, first semester when you joined, up to now, the last semester, you have definitely grown in the things of God. Right? And you've been equipped for every good work. Right? So uh, the equipping happens not just so that we can say that, hey, I finished my degree. Oh, I finished uh, my course. Yeah, that's just that's just in the natural. But you are equipped. You and I are equipped to equip others. What we learn, we share it with others, and we want to see others do as much as what we do, or even more than that. Right, and we want to see that chain, a ripple effect. And so, as as a leader, our mindset must be. Not to look at people, okay, he's, you know, he's just learning, so, uh, you know, no, he's still small, he's still immature and things of God. No, when you look at a person, look at him, what do you see in the future? Remember we talked about the relationship between Paul and Timothy. When Paul, I'm sure when Paul saw Timothy, he didn't see a 17-year-old boy who was, uh, you know, uh, of, with a good testimony. Probably. The Apostle Paul saw Timothy as a leader, equipped in the things of God, leading a church. He saw him as to what God saw him. Remember we talked about that? Everyone saw Peter as a fisherman. Jesus saw Peter as a leader of the church. So when we are, when we are equipping ourselves, don't hold on to it. Learn to give it up. Learn to equip others. Now you may feel, hey, I'm just in the workplace. How do I equip others? You can. In small ways. You can probably start a small group. You can start a Bible study. You can, uh, you know, uh, in some ways now with things going online or Zoom and all of that, uh, you know, just probably do a once a week Bible study take uh, topical studies, take word studies, character studies, so much that we can, you can do, right? And it may be, you know, you start, you want to start a Bible study session and you may have, you know, two people joining. Don't be discouraged. Remember, you are equipped to equip others. Those two people are as much as important if there are 2,000 people. So, so remember that you're equipping others, you're discipling. Right? It's a process when it comes to discipleship. Because, you know, in the time and age that we're living in, uh, everyone's seen numbers. Okay. People are fascinated by numbers. 10,000 people, 20,000 people in the church. Oh, Now, all of that is, it's good. We want to see that Jesus himself said, I will build my church. Uh, in the book of Acts, he says, the Lord added to the church daily. Right? So it's good that a church grows, many people come to Christ, but it's it's not about having a huge church and not being able to equip others. You can have 100 people in your church and have all 100 of them equipped in the word of God, and those 100 can go out and minister to another you know, 100 people each. Right? So, so always... You know, look at the bigger picture. That's two. You never know. You're teaching somebody the word of God, and two people have joined online. And in those two, one of them could be the next Billy Graham. Or the other person could be the next Renard Bonke. We don't know. Right? All we're doing is we are being faithful to minister to, the, to what God has given us.
We are equipped to equip others. Look at the great Apostle Paul. He learned all of this. He had these great revelations. He had this, you know, extremely high understanding of this Old Testament. And when he saw Jesus, he was able to relate, probably relate every aspect, every offering, Levitical offering. He could relate it to Christ and he just could, you know, bring that whole puzzle together. And he had such a strong understanding of the old and the new covenant. But he didn't keep it to himself. He went on. He says, you are my glory. You, the people, you are my crown. You are my joy in heaven. And his heart was to see people raised up and turned to Christ. And that should be our heart as well. But whatever I have learned, Whatever I know, help me not to be selfish. I know none of us are selfish. It's not like we don't want to share it. Uh, but start off small. Right? Don't despise those small beginnings. Even if it's one person, even if it's a child that you're ministering to, it's OK. It could be a 10-year-old child that you're ministering to. Uh, don't look down on them, because that child can grow up to be a next great you know, apostle or prophet of God, used greatly for the kingdom of God. What happens? You're equipped to equip others. Right? And then the next point, uh, uh, this will be the seventh point, right? OK, group discipleship. When it comes to uh, discipling in a group, right? not one on one, but group discipleship, uh, it's very important to, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this, right? Too. Uh, be very sensitive, culturally sensitive, understand, you know, people are coming from different backgrounds, people have different levels of understanding, people are at different uh, levels in their walk, of, uh, walk with God. So you, uh, you be sensitive to each of their, uh, each of their, you know, level of understanding and also be available for them uh, when it comes to group discipleship. Then we talked about mentorship, right? So when it comes to mentorship, uh, mentorship calls for, uh, we look also at three demands when it comes to discipleship, but mentoring calls for uh, action, it calls for uh, sacrifice, right? You uh, you must be able to bring in your expertise also when it comes to mentoring. Meaning, so for example, mentoring doesn't always have to be uh, in terms of the scripture, right? Now, for example, you know, uh, as as a cell group leader, you may have a young man who's just completed his college, and he may say, "Hey, uh, you know, I don't know what to do. Uh, I don't know what course to take up, or what should I do? Where, 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 which line of work I should go to? Uh, or I want to start a small business. Uh, I don't know how to go about doing it." Now, you may be uh, just a teacher, for example, right? But you know somebody who is in small business, so you can connect them and they are able to mentor each other. So as a leader, be, a, be you know, serve freely. Make sure that it, it shouldn't be a selfish ambition. No, this person should be mentored only by me. So that whoever he meets or she meets, they will say, my mentor is this person. No. Now, if I don't know anything about business and a person, a young man, it says, I want to be mentored and I want to know how to start a business. If I hold on to it and say, OK, first let me learn about business and then I will teach you about business. You're just going to give him head knowledge. But if there is a person who's already gone through, who, who has maybe 15 years of experience in business, gone through the ups and downs, seen failures, seen challenges, seen victories, they know how the system works. When you connect them, it is so much more fruitful to the other person. Right? So one of the responsibilities as a disciple, as a mentor, uh, is to connect people to be, you know, it comes under building relationships as well, is to connect the right person to the right uh, mentor, to the right mentee as well. Right? Then teaching from God's word. We talked about this, right? The ability to teach God's word, the ability to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit, the ability to counsel uh, from God's word, uh, you know, the ability to 
uh, you know, preach and teach in a way that people can understand through varied audiences. Right? And these are abilities that we develop over time. And finally, uh, in discipleship, it's about living life together. The book of Acts. Remember what happens after the Pentecost chapter 5 and uh, going forward is people sold their properties. I always wondered about this. If people sold their properties, came and put it at the feet of the disciples and said, use it for ministry. And they did not stop breaking of bread in homes, in gladness and joy, in, in persecution. I believe in the book of Acts, especially in Jerusalem, there's this whole thing of Jews and Gentiles was broken off. It was broken off. Especially in Jerusalem. We could see it. And, uh, uh, after a while, you know, talking about after you know the Gentiles were open to the ministry of the work of the Holy Spirit, and God was just the Jews were fine. They said, Okay, everything's open. Anyone can receive the gift that God has for us. This whole thing of Jews and Gentiles was broken off. But then in the other, uh, when Paul the Apostle goes, he travels to many places. He did see that division was still there. Uh, uh, you know. So this, all of these divisions are caused by the enemy. But remember, discipleship is about living life together. Now, I'm not saying that we must sell all our possessions and give it to the church. No, what it means is to live life together, be there for each other. The Apostle Paul says, mourn with those who are mourning, rejoice, or be joyful with those who are joyful. To the Jew be a Jew, to the Greek be a Greek. Meaning, live life together. Right? Be there for each other, support and strengthen each other. Right? Remember that you are a body of Christ. And Paul writes it so beautifully in... Uh, he writes in uh, Corinthians, he writes it in uh, Galatians again. He says, you're a body. And all of you are part of that body. You're one body in Christ. So as part of the body, you have to live together, work together to make the body function well. So in discipleship, work together, live together, uh, you know, spend time together. And this is only going to help us to, you know, fulfill the commission. You know, no matter where we are, no matter how small, whatever small work we may be doing, remember you're fulfilling the commission that God has given you. So these are a few points. These are all what we shared in our notes. I just wanted to just summarize all of it. But I also wanted to talk about three demands when it comes to uh, uh, discipleship, right? Uh, first one is discipleship demands commitment, right? Uh, let me just put it here. Commitment. When you talk about discipleship, uh, it demands commitment. And uh, it cannot be done just overnight. It's not a. It's not a one event. We talk about it, right? You've got to, when it comes to a cell group, if you are discipling people, you've got to call them, you've got to try and meet with them. There'll be times if people are happy, there'll be times people are sad, people are going through seasons. You've got to be with them. You, there's time, there's resources that God has given you, and you have to be committed to it. It's not easy. But as leaders, God gives us that grace god gives us that ability to be committed right? you know, when we look at scriptures especially in, uh, in the new testament the early church they were committed to the things of god now many of us may say hey they didn't have much work that we have right we have an eight hour shift um, and re remember this we don't have persecutions they were they had intense persecution they could have just sat at home and or just thought about doing their work, but they were committed to the cause of the gospel. They were committed to it. Uh, they didn't, they didn't uh, budge, meaning they didn't say, okay, let's, you know, let's do something else. Nobody likes this gospel of Jesus Christ. No, 
They are committed to the cause, committed to the point of death. And thankfully, we are in a place where you know nobody is, uh, you know, nobody is asking us to leave Christianity and you know, we may be put to death. Thank God we don't have that kind of persecution. But when it comes to discipleship, it could be commitment in small things, like maybe just a 15 minute prayer with the person you're ministering to, maybe a, just a phone call, uh, you know, during the week. There could be many other reasons, but it calls for commitment. Okay, uh, the second point, let me just put that up, demands discipleship, demands sacrifice, right? And we talked about this, right? Uh, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever would save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Right. So now we're not talking about you know giving up your life here. He's talking about sacrifice. Right. When it comes to discipleship, we must be willing to sacrifice. That sacrifice could be sometimes, you know, as I said, it's not not always that you have to sacrifice of life, but it's sacrifice of time, money, resources, sleep, a uh, few things that we may have to sacrifice. Uh, but it's part of what discipleship carries. It's, you know, it's wonderful when people say, hey, he's discipling me or he's mentoring me. Uh, but it's it also calls for sacrifice. And especially when you look at ministry, not only discipleship, many other things that we do in ministry calls for sacrifice. And this is the third demand uh, is discipleship demands humility. The Lord Jesus did something very powerful. Um, just before he's sending his disciples out to preach, uh he offered them some wisdom right and he said a disciple is not above the teacher matthew 10 i think matthew 10 24 uh, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his lord right but he also warned them and he said uh that they will they will be like sheep sent among wolves they will be delivered uh, to councils, they'll be scourged in the synagogues, they'll be brought in front of kings and governors, and they'll be put to trial, they'll be persecuted. Jesus put, he laid out everything for the disciples. Very contrary, you know, how many of us would take it up and say, oh, okay, here's what is going to happen. Number one, people are going to ridicule you and mock you. Two, they're going to catch you, they're going to put you in a prison. Three, they're going to uh, be like wolves, they're going to just uh, eat you out in the sense they just attack you on every side. How many of us would take up this you know, and say no? Uh, but if on the flip side, if we say, okay, uh, you know, you're going to get to preach, you're going to get to travel, get to see places, people are going to respect you, they, you know, you're going to see mighty miracles and healings and all of these things. We would most probably, we'd love to see all of that, and we will say yes as well. But Jesus, before sending out his disciples, he humbled them and he said, listen, I know that probably he did this because he knew that, Jesus knew that he was famous. He knew that, okay, the 12 also knew that Jesus was famous. If he was not famous, thousands of people would never follow. Why would thousands of people follow? 5,000 people at one time. Another place, 5,000 excluding children, women and children, probably 8,000 people old. Why would so many people follow Jesus? And I'm sure the disciples knew that, you know, Jesus is famous and they are in the team. And, you know, it's very, or James and John are saying, give me the left spot and the right spot. And there was all of these things that is happening. But I'm sure they were, they had probably a little bit of head weight. But Jesus says, listen, I'm sending you as wolves. They're going to catch you. It's not as rosy as it looks. They're going to beat you. They're going to persecute you. They're going to say all kinds of evil against you. 
but I want you to learn to walk in humility. Yet, when you walk in humility, I will give you the power. The anointing of the Holy Spirit will destroy the works of the devil. And when you see that, don't ever think it's your own ability. Walk in humility and know that it is God that is working for you. So even in discipleship, right, we walk in humility, knowing that, hey, it's not about us. It's, it's just that God is using us as a tool. I love the book of Jeremiah, right? Shall the, shall the potter, shall the clay say to the potter, why have you made me this way? The, the clay has no words to say. And he's only really trying to speak to, uh, you know, to Israel and say, you walk in humility. How can you tell me why are the Babylonians coming? Why are the Assyrians coming? Why are we in bondage? You don't, you know, oh, well, you're the clay. I'm the potter. I'll make you the way I want you to be. You humble yourself. It's talking to the, uh, the people of Israel. You humble yourself. Change your ways. I am the potter. You are the clay. I will, I will do what I promised to do for you. Discipleship demands commitment, demands sacrifice, demands humility. There's many more, but I just put all of it, uh, encompass all of it. All right. all right, so we've come to a close of this course. Uh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed teaching and learning. Uh, throughout this entire course. Uh, do you have any questions, any thoughts that you would like to share? Feel free to do so now. Do you have any questions, any thoughts? OK. All right, good. So this is your last semester. Yes. Go ahead, Abu Bakr. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, where, uh, good morning, sir. Uh, uh, concerning the attendance, sir. Uh, I don't think I, I missed any of your class. Uh, any of okay. your class. But, uh, in my attendance, I, I, I just called uh, 7 to 10. And I don't think I, I missed any of your class. I don't know how the, how the city attendance. I don't know. I don't understand. I don't know how. Please kindly help me to do something about it. Uh, precisely in our country here in Nigeria, uh, we have the issue of network. Uh, at times, uh, our network will break and come back, break and come, I don't know. And, but I don't think that one will affect the plan. Uh, it's only today now that I woke up late. Okay, uh, Abu uh, Bakre, I, uh, I, I couldn't really hear you too well because of the uh, your voice can break me up. But I, if, if it's something to do with attendance, uh, uh, what you can do is just send an email to the administrator and uh, uh, you know you can get more details on that. I did understand that you were saying that the network is low, sometimes you get cut off. Uh, but in terms of attendance, you can just send an email. Any, any query you have regarding classes, the courses, uh, any query you have, you can just send an email to uh, the administrator or you can just email Pastor Nancy and uh, she'll be able to give you like details uh, regarding anything you have in terms of the classes. Uh, right, and Divya, uh, you said this regarding assignment, can we given be given more time? Since you're talking about the midterm assessment, Divya? Yes, Pastor. Okay, sure, sure. You can. It's all right. No worries. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. So, what what would be uh, what, what I'll do is I will I will make the change if there is a due date. I'll make the change. Uh, 
I uh, can just probably give you a couple of days extra. OK. Yeah, yeah that will be great. It's a very simple uh, open book exam, right? Just, uh, <laughs> just to review ourselves, that's it. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Rest. Welcome. Uh, I, I think for the midterm exam, I didn't put a due date in. So you can just, you can just post it. But I'll double check. If there is a due date, I can extend it. Saturday is the due date. Okay, I'll change that. Okay. Yeah. Right. All right. Anything else? Okay. So, uh, so it's interesting. It's very, uh, very nice to know that you know each one of you are graduating. So, thank you for staying the course. It's wonderful, uh, and I'm sure the Lord is going to use each one of you greatly for His kingdom and. Uh, uh, thank you so much for you know just being here and studying together. I'll see you soon, uh, probably at the graduation. So have a great time. Uh, continue to learn, continue to grow, uh, continue to be a blessing. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll see you soon, right? God bless you all. Have a great time ahead. God bless. <laughs>